So today's speaker is Paul Freitas. Uh, he's Professor of Economics and Wellbeing at MBS College in Saudi Arabia. Previously, he was a Professor in Wellbeing Economics at the LSE, and he remains an Emeritus Professor. Prior to this, Paul worked in Australia for 15 years and was the Research Director of the Rumisi Project, probably didn't pronounce that correctly, an international project analyzing the migration of people from the countryside to the cities in China and Indonesia. The project, which was sponsored by ministries, the World Bank, the Ford Foundation and many others, tracked 20,000 individuals over many years. In 2009, he was voted Australia's best young economist under 40 by the Australian Economic Society. Paul has a master's in econometrics, sorry, econometrics and a PhD entitled Wellbeing in Russia During the Transition. He published regularly in top 50 economics journals as well as interdisciplinary outlets and handbooks. He has co-authored around 150 papers, six books, and is in the top 1% of cited economists. Paul is interested in all aspects of social science, but particularly well-being and public policy. He has in the past worked as a health economist, a labor economist, a specialist on the economics of China, and an econometrician. econometrician. So, um, fantastic uh, resume there, Paul. Well, welcome, and um, over to you. Thank you very much for that kind of introduction. And great to be with Pandate. I very much feel uh, among friends, and I've been looking forward to sort of, you know, telling you of what your brethren in the Netherlands uh, have been up to uh, and hope that you can join us. So you should very much see this as a, as a presentation of somebody who hopes to share a journey with several of you. Um, so this presentation will be about uh, an initiative that we've been working on sort of for a couple of years already, but which is which is speeding up in terms of implementation. So we now have the name for an organization. It's called Nova Academia. We also have a URL. So we actually have a website that's being developed as we speak. And it's hence about a new academy. Right? So some preliminaries, the basic presumption we have, and I, I think I don't need to defend that for this audience is that the current universities we have throughout the West, particularly the Anglosphere, I would say, is that those universities have failed. Very poor teaching, poor personal development of students, if there's any interest in that at all. Our students, our kids are made fearful, woke, bureaucratic, very bureaucratic. It's very captured also by special interests. So they essentially fail to do what they were supposed to, fail to stimulate, prepare our kids. They infantilize the academics so the good ones leave and they weaken society instead of representing the best of it. So our societies need, in, in my view, uh, spaces where the future intellectuals can be nurtured, major problems are looked at, and you know ways are found to overcome many of the personal challenges that we face in this world. Um, in which case, I, I sort of also mean social media addiction, the uh, atomization of our youth, the fact that they're sort of lost on social media. Uh, if, if answers are found to those problems anywhere, it should be in our academies. They should be the places that experiment their way out of that. So what we're looking for is to sort of start new academic institutions and, and oriented towards critical thinking. We're inherently and openly elitist, I'm afraid. So this initiative is aimed at the top 5%, but from that position, trying to help the rest of society. So what are our plans? We want to come to a new university in three steps. We start out with a mentorship program, and we very much would like everybody who's listening to sort of consider becoming a mentor. Uh, this will be primarily online, mentorship of research-capable critical thinkers, and I'll explain a lot more about what I mean with that, by willing academics. So this is sort of by us for those who want to join in with research or self-education type activities. Then the second step, and we want to start that September 2024, would be a one-year program. We're thinking of a one-year master's level social science program. We want to have a campus, so education that is uh, that requires people to be present, form communities with 50 to 150 students and one to three streams of disciplines uh, using part-time academics. 
And then a full-on university in two to three years' time. But for that, a lot needs to happen and a lot more people need to find us. So these are the people who are trying to make it happen. And let me explain them a bit to you so that you sort of know where we're coming from and what the networks are that we've plugged into. So you can see me on the right. I've just been introduced. If I then go counterclockwise, the first one you dare see is Jamila Lepere. She has been a, a long-time advocate for the freedom of Julian Assange and has sort of worked very hard for his release, uh, organizes many demonstrations and writes on the topic. She's also been part of the Four Waarheid, the sort of Willem Engel group in the Netherlands, which has sort of tried to oppose the COVID lockdowns, do legal actions against that, and generally try to awaken the population. Then if we go to the left again, there's Chiert Andringa. He is a cognitive scientist, also an expert on sounds. Uh, and he is now, uh, as we're our chief pilot, if you like, is that he's starting out uh, a cognitive program for um, people in college, but it's not associated with the university where he worked for many, many years. Uh, and this is a program to try to help smart youngsters make up their own worldview. And he's sort of been working on that for a long, long time and has sort of uh, really worked out how to do that well. So he's one of our cognitive thinkers, uh, really good at sort of getting people to go on their own journey. Uh, then there's Erica Turkstra, who's to the far left. Uh, she's the one I'm married to. Uh, and she's our chief location, but she has also been for 10 years an associate professor at Griffith. She's an expert on health technology. And she's now also doing things sort of resistance, among which is finding a good place for us in the Netherlands to do this one-year program. We do have things in mind. Then we have Dolph van Weck. He was a trained biologist, but also a chemical engineer. He's worked for a long time in... Uh, in Brussels, and he has been very active in the resistance in the Netherlands. He's organized the first science summit in Amsterdam and the second science summit in Amsterdam as well. Uh, and he's very active in the Belgian resistance. He's, he's organized large scale conferences and is very, very well connected. And he's sort of bringing in uh, Belgian resistance individuals and thinkers, including Matthias de Smet. Then Anna Willersen, she is our, our sort of star reporter, if you like. She works for several of the resistance newspapers and uh, podcasts and television um, forum in the Netherlands. Uh, she is unfortunately about to emigrate to Paraguay uh, to sort of uh, escape the oppression in, uh, in Europe, but she wants to remain with this. And she's got a large network of students and other critical young thinkers. Uh, then probably the best known guy among us, that's Willem Engel to the far right. He's sort of a resistance fighter in the Netherlands, has been so effective that the authorities have put him in jail on bogus charges and then had to release him. And in the uh, a court case, basically the authorities lost on, on all but a minute of their trumped up charges. Uh, and he's very much uh, our sort of our, our cultural ambassador, but also uh, has a, a large network of uh, supporters, sponsors, uh, students and volunteers whom he's partly mobilizing uh, for this endeavor. So he's as it were chief culture, chief critique, we have a chief media, chief organizer, if you like, uh, chief location, chief pilot, chief admin, and myself. I'm so I'm the academic director of the endeavor. Then, well, we're we're serious about this, so I want to envelop you into you know what the timing of this thing is. At the third of September, we had a a big moment to say, are we going to do this or not? And we decided, okay, we're going to do this. And then by December of this year, we we want to have the mentorship program up and running. Uh, and we're sort of well on the way to do that. Around about April 24 is the last moment we can bow out of the one-year program. That's where we're going to run boot camps and all kinds of open days for parents and that sort of thing to get enrollment for the one-year program. By September 24, we want to have the one-year program up and running. And uh, then, you know, the the, the full-on university would be several years in the future, but then other other things need to happen before that's possible. We can't do that with the current crew or resources. So what's the things we're currently working on? Uh, if you go from left to right, uh, IT websites, we signed a contract, we're setting it up, we've got a website, we're hoping to be live in one or two months time. If you're thinking of helping us, what is particularly wanted is a part-time IT person who can help us set up communities on Discord. It's an old gaming website, it's very useful for forming online communities uh, and setting up um, the ability of, of everybody to sort of have joint video calls, share documents, 
uh, and uh, and sort of publicize work. Um, and unfortunately, if you know somebody, they also need to be able to speak Dutch because the majority of the people associated with, with it will be Dutch uh, and not all of them speak English. Then location, we've identified good enough locations in the Netherlands, but we're searching for better. So we're searching for large rural land houses or small castles, preferably on the Dutch-Belgian border. Uh, and if you think of other things you'd like to do at a physical location and have some resources to share, that'd be good. So headquarters of Panda, maybe secondary schools or institutes would be very, very welcome to share. Then on students, that'll probably be our biggest bottleneck. We aim to find them via our contacts, via the academics and via push within the new media networks, including this one. Right? Uh, we've involved students to fine tune, but we'd like more of those as well. So one, it would be help in disseminating. So if people have um, outlets in order to sort of reach potential students for the one-year program and the mentorship program in particular, that'd be great. Uh, and probably also one needs to get at the parents because they're the ones who are probably going to have to pay for some of this. Networking activities are, of course, all begging for money. Right? Uh, we think we're going to set up the one-year program regardless, even if we find no money. Uh, but more money would be definitely useful. Okay. The rest is details, as I might say. So let's get to the most important details I sort of want you to know. Right? What, what, what is the thinking behind this? What's the longer term ambition? Where, where are we coming from? Well, where we're coming from is that we want a radical break with current academia. We really think academia has lost its way. So we want to escape admin. We want to escape the government by building up this sort of own signaling mechanism. So we want to escape the, the sort of the clutches of the accreditation structures, which are all set up to sort of make you as useless as possible. That means we got to sort of flag how good we are in other ways. So we'd like to set up prediction races, startups, job fairs, right? We do want to be able to offer careers to students. So we are interested in that side of things. So we want to set up a community of scholars and other thinkers. Then a second differentiating aspect of what we want to do is what we want to have a real interest in addressing the whole person. So we don't just sort of want to sort of teach critical thought and political economy, but also aesthetics, spirituality. We, we sort of want to address some of the modern ills of atomization, essentially also the problem of how to be a community again, how to live with each other. I think that in many ways, our societies have lost that ability and we don't know how well to do it. I myself ask myself, how am I going to be a community of scholars again with others? I've not sort of had to be one for 20 years. Uh, and I think the problem is even worse for people who've never been a community their whole life. How to escape the addictions of social media, mobile phones. I think that's something that academia should be interested in and should be experimenting and should be, as it were, co-creating with, with students and with others uh, solutions to these things. Um, so it's also about the best of classic academia, critical thinking, freedom of thought, helping people build their own view of the world, freedom of conscience. But we're not Luddites. We do want to envelop the best of the modern world, right? use of the latest techniques. And we want to orient ourselves also to address modern problems. So not as it were try to live like uh, 2000 years ago in Greece, but also address and live with the fact that you've got to live in a modern age uh, and you've got to tackle the problems of obesity, diet, atomization, that sort of thing. So we hope to have this college sort of be a, a place of hope, but also a home for people like ourselves. We'd like to see the emergence of lots of sort of small academias like this, free thinking colleges in various countries, uh, because the more small ones there are, the harder it is to take down and the easier it is to set up shop elsewhere if authority does close you down. Uh, and then, of course, they should, they should form the intellectual elite but also take that position truly seriously and then help secondary schools, help the 95% in all ways that an academic uh, community can and should. Now, what is the relation to other current initiatives? Right? There are other current initiatives in the education space. Maybe you've heard of Hillsdale College, uh, which has a sort of a, a critical thinking curricula. Um, they and others like it are essentially summer courses of critical thinking. So they sometimes have a campus, sometimes they rent a place like the John Locke Institute uh, around Oxford. But these are limited in time and sort of also limited in terms of how ambitious they are. Um, then there's a place like the Hoover Institute. They also try to educate critical thinking, but they have in mind young politicians, and they're essentially trying to set themselves up very similar to the World Economic Forum, just with a slightly tweaked program, but still very much sort of a, a top-down um, mindset. 
Then you have some things which you might not have heard of, Genius U, which is an international one, Buildings Academy, which is a Dutch one, and some other ones that I heard about yesterday, like the, the Kaufman Initiative, but also Jordan Peterson's initiative. Uh, these are largely online initiatives, so sort of online workshops around topics that you may or may not be interested in. Uh, then New College, some of these things in Texas and Florida. These are sort of old universities that now have a slightly changed leadership but they still live with most of the problems uh, and don't show any intention of getting rid of those problems. They still have a huge problematic bureaucracy, still dependent on sponsors which want the wrong thing. They've by now got the wrong academics, the wrong students, the wrong parents and all that. So they're going to have great difficulties escaping from the business model that they've got. Now then why start with a mentorship program? Why are we doing that, right? Well, it's, it has its own function. We think the mentorship program makes sense itself. We want to stimulate independent pro-social research and to engender a growing active academic community. So it's, a, it's an easy way to start. We, we want it, to use it to prepare for longer, larger term programs as well. So we're assembling and organizing the right academics, the people in our tribe, if you like, including uh, hopefully everybody on this call. We're organizing the students and teachers, so we're starting to gear up to learn how to do that. And we're creating a brand and building the wider organization. We're setting up IT, HR structures, uh, which are just inevitable. Of course, this is cheap to set up. So a mentorship program is one of the cheapest things you can start out with. And you get to start out with what we think are the right questions. You know, what are the markets for sort of pro-social research uh, for society? We're starting to be real as to what can we actually do? What resources have we got? Uh, when can we do this for? What research would we like to help? How do we select students? How do we disseminate things amongst whom? What events? Who would go there? What would the cost be, right? And of course, this program can be its own ongoing thing, spawning other initiatives organically. Now, what are the visuals going to look like? Well, we've had the same IT team which has done this one, which is Australian Science and Freedom. I've been one of the co-founders of that endeavor, and we're going to have a conference at the end of November. And, uh, and, and having had the same team, we're also doubling up with the same computer service that so made it slightly cheaper. Uh, we've got very sort of committed IT people to do this. So it'll look like this. It'll look sort of blue and quite professional, we hope. Um, we'll have these kind of mentorship uh, pages. Now, this is not from the Australian Science of Freedom from an existing Australian university, so you shouldn't look at the name, but you should sort of look at the visuals of this. You can then click on the mentors. You could search for them in all kinds of search terms. Now, how are we going to run the mentorship program? Since I'm trying to convince you to join it, uh, let me give you some more details. Right? We, we sort of go for minimum uh, admin and maximum input by academics. So it's very much uh, academic-led thing. The academics have an awful lot of discretion about what they want to do. So the selection of students will be mainly up to academics. The admin is not going to run a selection thing. It's not going to be a one-year program whereby there's sort of an entry and a selection and then they can decide on academics. No, no, it's going to be uh, set up by the academics, but with IT support, right? We recommend some elements. We recommend a physical meeting, and we're going to set up some conferences, hopefully by the 26th of November, uh, but also ensuing ones in the Netherlands and Belgium to weed out f uh, fakes and cracks, right? We want a, a physical, normal price mentorship conference at some point so that there's a pre-commitment. And the quid pro quo, so what do the academics want to return? Well, that's set by the academics. Right? And I'll give you some example of what some of the academics have in mind. The activities and research questions that would be done by a mentor are basically up to the academics. And we're going to have a, a sort of a, a, a standardized pro form that uh, interested academics can fill in, but it's essentially up to them as to what the activities and research questions are that they want to support with their time. And we're not going to pay the academics. It's very much uh, a volunteer thing. We definitely want the academics and the students to band into groups, which is why we're now uh, committed to go to the Discord website as an online community building vehicle. What's Nova Academia going to do? We're going to do the IT, first conferences, media branding, finding fellow academics, some of the media towards the students, research output, dissemination, basic admin. What is our intended audience? It's basically anybody who's research capable. So you shouldn't think of 18-year-olds. I'm also thinking of lots of school te uh, teachers around the world. I'm pretty much thinking of, of anybody with a brain who is good at research or is interested enough to really make a serious go at it uh, and is sort of really, really willing to put in effort for that. Uh, they could live anywhere in the world and, and could have a job. 
Now some example programs. Uh, this is what uh, Shishi Foster sort of offered. She's also a professor in New South Wales, uh, sort of a co-founder of Australian of Science and Freedom. And she, she then sets up her interest, how it would work, the things she would want to work on. She has some selection criteria and she has an application process, basically emailing her at the Science and Freedom website. And she wants, you know, 1500 words essay. So that's the pre-commitment device. If you don't want to write 1500 words, she's not even going to look at it. Uh, and there's an online reception then planned in that. Of course, you shouldn't take the date seriously, but it tells you. Right? And also note that in her selection criteria, she says a commitment to using research to serve the broad social good. That's the quid pro quo she asks for. She's going to give them her time for free to work on the research she finds interesting. She's still going to ask that the students are going to do some social good. Now, then what have I put up? I just sort of put this together last week when I asked myself, well, what would I be willing to spend my time on for free? I'd be interested in joining up for new basic textbooks in economics and social science. I've wanted to do that for a while. I just don't have the energy and time, but if I find a good enough research capable person who, who can sort of um, co-develop that uh, and sort of has the time and the energy to fill in a lot of the blanks, that would be something I'd be willing to do. I'd be interested in a project into mapping existing participatory democracy systems in which I've sort of published various new ideas and proposals, but sort of doing it in, the, in a more robust and rigorous manner would be very interesting and that too can lead to papers videos and a book just like the new textbooks and i'd be interested in building new historical narratives right i think our movement should grab history storytelling uh, and we should sort of generate our own stories on what history is uh, of, of our ancestors and current society and i think that'd be very useful It'd be good exercise but also something that's really pro-social um now, if you think of, okay, who's already put their hands up? Quite a lot. This this seems to be quite popular. So uh, myself, Chia Erica, Gigi, uh, Matthias de Smet, Cameron Murray is uh, another Australian case from the PAL. He's a Marxist historian from Dixhorn and another historian. Um, we've got quite a number of people, including journalists, including people who who are linguists so and school teachers. So there's quite a few within the resistance who think, yeah, I, I actually do want to self-replicate in some sense. I, I do want to offer my services to the next generation. Now, we have not really seriously started writing to people. So this is the first venture in which I openly say, come join. But uh, we, we think that, that as with the academic mentorship side is not going to be a huge problem where we're, we're already credible. Right? Now, how are we going to select? Uh, essentially, it's up to the academic director of the um, of the endeavor at the moment to sort of be decider. But we're a very egalitarian outfit, so we, we sort of do it via consensus between the academics who are already involved. And what we want: critical, pro-social, team playing. So no narcissists, please. Good thinkers, and not just academics. We we think there should be a broad movement and have have lots of sort of specialties or, or just interests involved there right now if you're thinking about this what what are the things we we offer you in this way right one is safety and credibility and numbers so you you don't look ridiculous on a website you'll be among dozens of others and furthermore if if nobody puts their hand up for whatever project you have in mind don't worry in principle nobody will ever know so um, it's sort of, you know, the, the, the information is one-sided, if you like, uh, of, of success in that sense. Um, and so you can, as it were, with fairly low cost to yourself, just openly advertise, okay, I, I want to do this. You have the advantage of a joint brand, joint events, joint IT, basic dissemination, so some key shared resources. You're among a community of scholars, and hopefully you will start to function more as a community. Now, then the second thing, uh, that's the mentorship program. Uh, then what do we think a one-year college could work? Well, what you see here is sort of the cheapest way it can be done. Basically, a large farm with a sort of a, a permanent camping type thing. So glamping things, which would be warmed and there'd be a small shower and a small kitchen in there. So you can sort of put 100 students in there at a price that is within our budget, right? Um, and then you'd have all kinds of indoor events. Uh, and of course, you try to be close to a large city so that there's something for the students other, other to do than form their own communities. 
Now, what would the key academic activities be of the one-year college? Well, we're oriented towards helping students form their own worldview, right? So we're not sort of trying to indoctrinate them into how we think the world works. We want to open their minds and make them think as themselves, right? That's, that's the idea of really uh, creating uh, elite thinkers, if you like. Um, and so the first three months, which were basic subjects, statistics, mind formative programs, critical thought, if you want to call it that way, a um, bit like philosophy of science, but a much more involved and serious than what, what I've seen current universities give. Right? So more Socratic, uh, more Jules Verne type uh, methodologies. And you can ask me later what that means. And involving the whole person. We want to have introspection, emotion, aesthetics. Right? So we want to do other stuff and just be apart from being pure academic. Then nine months, particular disciplines, and that depends on who shows up, who functions well in the mentorship programs. Uh, minimally political economy. Why that? Because I can offer that with the, the sort of the, the tribe of economists I bring along to this project, but with other, in the, uh, other disciplines, depending on who else shows up and what the interest among students is. And the various key teaching styles. So quite experiential. We're going to have prediction races. Uh, a note methodology, effectively as, as little as it were, formative exam as possible, but still the, at a pretty high level. And of course, some degree of output orientation, some degree of also peer review judging of outputs. Now, there are many, many considerations. So just to, to let you know what sort of wakes me up at night, you know, for the one year program to work. The academics got, got to learn how to be a community again. Well, we haven't done that in decades. So it's going to be difficult, right? Because by now our egos have become too big and they need to shrink again. We we need to make room for each other and, and accept the fact that none of us are 100% going to get our way. That's difficult. It'll take time. Now, for the one-year program to work, there also needs to be this whole life development side. I, I think I can see how the academic side can be set up and function and get it together. But the life development side, the culture, the aesthetics, the spirituality that it needs an emotional warmth that uh, I'm not able to sort of give. So that needs a, a whole different type uh, of mentor to be involved. And so I'm very happy to have, for instance, Jamila and Willem as two of the key people who are much better at that. Uh, and, and they hopefully will take care of that side of things. And of course, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. So the social organization of this type of endeavor will be up to many, including students. So they, they're going to be involved in their own development. Now, last thoughts, if you think you can help, please join us. This, this is by us, for our children, right? very much. If you don't like this program, set up something similar in the UK. Start your own thing. Have your own niche. If you don't like the elitism of this thing, uh, have a different focus. And, of course, there are many other building initiatives. I, I hope our tribes, as it were, can start doing in the future. Right? Alternative health systems, alternative childcare, job employment systems. And so the real building, rebuilding, if you like, of true communities with entangled lives. I think all that's pretty possible and highly desirable. So thank you very much for so patiently listening to me. I hope 